Welcome to the spring digital ag semi webinar, a little bit of seminar, a little bit of webinar. It depends on where you are, but we're glad to have several of you in person today. And certainly appreciate those that are online. Um, oops. So this is a series on several topics um, that kind of introduces you to it. So watch for announcements. We'll do these nominally every four weeks. For those of you that are at Purdue, on the two-week interval, there will be other uh, workshop-type uh, seminars on campus. There's announcements as well. So just a little bit more work from our uh, sponsors. There is the Purdue Digital Ag Resources website page. We encourage you to go there to see what the upcoming series is. And there's also a very good UAV extension website if that's your area of interest. So these are the coming topics uh, over the next uh, couple months. Just like to study those. Uh, we certainly encourage you to participate live if you can. Uh, they will all be recorded and we'll put them on our culture YouTube playlist as well. So if you're not going to miss it, just watch for the update coming later. So this is how we'll work today. Uh, we want you to, if you're online, your cam off and web, uh, microphone off during the presentation. At the end, we might invite you to open up and, and post some questions. We'll probably take the questions live here in the room. Give some preference there uh, at the end. If you are online and you pose a question, do not send it to the presenter only because the presenter station is tied up um, in today by Dr. Couture and he's not watching chat. Uh, so you watch chat offline. So make sure that you just send the question to all in, in the chat. Uh, so that's a little bit of that. And without much more ado, today's topic is uh, hyperspectral uses in uh, precision ag and phenotyping. Uh, so I'll make a short introduction to Dr. John Couture. He may add more. Uh, I am impressed uh, by John, who has a joint appointment in both entomology and forestry and natural resources. He has very strong collaborations across departments, colleges, uh, and even across institutions. Uh, he has installed and uses measurements uh, by different sensors in a wide variety of scales and in different applications. So I think his, uh, the context of his comments and knowledge come well grounded in, in the diversity of applications. Uh, John's also one of our, I think the word is entrepreneurial fellow or something like that uh, here at our Purdue Foundry. So for those of you that are with entrepreneurial interests, he is a resource, he and others, uh, a resource for you to tap into. How do I do entrepreneurial things? So without further ado, let me switch the slides uh, to Dr. Couture's. Thank you, John. We're looking forward to learning some good things today. All right, thank you, Dennis. It's really happy to kick off the uh, second semester of the kind of digital ag forum. Um, first in-person talk I've given in two years is a nice mix of uh, nerves and being excited, all compounded by a two hour delay that my kids had this morning. So uh, going through um, the final slides is interesting. Uh, but what I'm gonna talk about is how do we use hyperspectral data to understand plant health in a precision egg work um, for precision egg framework. Okay. And I always start with this slide. I've been using this slide for over a decade now. And it really kind of helps me to frame why we do this work in the first place, right? We're at a very interesting time. Plant biology, plant ecology. Never before have we had as much um, high resolution um, and access to high resolution information about uh, plant biochemistry and plant genetics but in reality we've never needed that information more because we're confronted with a number of challenges that we face and coming up with the you know solutions to address those challenges is, is kind of one of the things i'm most interested in so whether it's losses in biodiversity changes in land use anthropogenic influences on uh, atmospheric composition and balancing all of how do we save the environment with the need to increase agricultural production uh, at double the rate. We're currently, uh, 
currently generating it um, to meet a growing population it is a big challenge that we have. And so what we need, in my opinion, and what my program does, is to try and find measurements that we can make at multiple different scales, whether that's at the suborganismal, that's measurement of a leaf, organismal at the level of individual or even at a landscape so we can start to develop questions that allow us to link these scales together whether it's at the level of individuals populations or communities to kind of help us understand how we can start to develop solutions to manage all of these issues we have and the approach that one of the approaches we used um, is spectroscopy and really it's been around for an exceptionally long time this is not we're not recreating the wheel here, right? At brass tacks, it's just the way the light interacts with the substrate, right? Whether it's scattered, reflected, absorbed, or transmitted. Where we focus on is um, vegetation spectroscopy. And what we're interested in is if you look at this figure, the little green, I'm gonna try this. The little green thing right there is to remind me to tell you this is it, this is what a spectrum of a green plant looks like in the solar spectrum right so right around 350 to 2500 nanometers um the way this looks differs depending upon the spatial scale that you collect this measurement we'll go over that in a minute but what influences the shape of this spectrum is kind of the biochemical and biophysical properties of the vegetation that you're looking at when you're making the measurement importantly much of what's contained in this spectrum is outside what we can see. So this is the visible wavelength range. This is what we see, right? This is what your phone takes a picture of. Um, there's, there's considerably more information that's related with plant health um, than just the visible. So we have the near infrared and we also have the short wave infrared, right? So there's this continuum and all are important in understanding plant Why is spectroscopy a potentially good tool to try and solve these problems? It's a scalable measurement, right? It doesn't look exactly the same. You can't transfer what you measure at a leaf to what you get from a satellite. But if you look at the general shape of each of these, they have, they're similar, right? You see the same rise in the red edge at about, you know, 800 nanometers, 700 nanometers. And you see the same <laughs> shapes as they kind of, you can see, you know, water absorption features out around 1,500 and 2,000 nanometers in each one. And in fact, there's so much noise in uh, airborne or satellite imagery that you can usually, you usually exclude those wavelength ranges. Um, but it's a scalable. So if we go back to what, how, how do we want to develop questions to, to address, um, or develop solutions to address questions at multiple spatial scales, this gives us the opportunity to do that. And if we think about it, we can start to calibrate these different, different instruments can make measurements at different scales with different resolutions. And if we can start to calibrate these at different spatial scales, um, we can start to bridge gaps, right? From our understanding of how an individual plant functions in a community to how a community functions within a given landscape, or how landscapes function in a given ecosystem or you know, at a continental uh, scale. And if we start to think about what we can, we can kind of view how these spectral data look in the concept of uh, an optical type. So um, postdoc mine put out a review, we put this out in 2017, where all of these stressors can influence the vegetation spectrum, right? Structure, chemistry, physiology, uh, stress, all of that can then be compressed into the concept of an optical type. What does something look like? What's the phenotype of an individual, right? Genetics influence that, um, a number of things do, but development on that, um, this concept of optical type, you can start to see that different plants are structured differently, whether it's how thick they are, right? Whether it's their genetic background, their genetic relatedness. All of this goes into influencing that spectral profile. And if we start to, to embrace this concept of an optical type, we can then exploit that concept to develop some of these solutions for the problems we have. And really one of the things is we can use what are called spectral fingerprints, right? Identifying features in spectral data to help us understand how and why plants are functioning a specific way in a given environment. 
So the, really, the question is, how can we use this information? And that's going to be the rest of the talk. What, what, how, do we, how does my group use this information to address some of these questions? Whether it's in kind of uh, invasive species or pest management, whether it's under uh, environmental change, variation of biodiversity, or agricultural production. So there's four ways my group uses it. Uh, vegetation indices, functional trait estimates, spectral phenotyping, and maps. And I'll go through all of these pretty briefly before we get into the nuts and bolts of what all of my students do. When I say we, it's really all of my students. Uh, vegetation indices, is everybody familiar with NDVI? I'm assuming everybody attending has an idea of NDVI as a measure of how green something is, right? It's the presence of green. Um, that's a, a pretty commonly used index. It's used because it's easy to generate. Um, you can get it from multi-spectral satellite data. You can get into vegetation chemical properties such as chlorophyll. There's indices to, to estimate nitrogen. You can get into physiology. Uh, the photochemical reflectance index, PRI on the bottom, is one that is related with photosynthetic efficiency, often correlated with plant stress. You can get water status. There's disease indexes. There's an index for almost everything that you can think of. And the neat thing is you can generate a new index if you want to with the spectral data, right? All you do is make different combinations of, of, of them and see how they relate with some target index. The issue is, is that they're rarely specific. They lack any specificity. Disease index will tell you if something is not feeling well. It won't tell you why it's not feeling well. So it could be a root rot. It could be some type of fungal pathogen on the leaf. It could be a pest insect. You know, it's all, it's related. So indexes are nice because they're easy to extrapolate, simple to use, and you can apply them. They lack any specificity when it comes to really getting into fine scale understanding of a response to stress. And I'll give you an example. <clears throat> Hessian fly and wheat, right? You don't know Hessian fly, it's a, it's a pest crop or it's a pest insect wheat. Uh, you can see on the bottom they do considerable damage. There was breeding for our gene mediated resistance, so it's a gene for gene interaction where you can get resistance phenotypes and um, uh, specific Hessian fly lines are not able to um, infest the plants, right? One of the things we're interested in doing, okay, what can spectral data tell us about this resistance? You know, what are the mechanisms of resistance, okay? And so we went through, and a previous student characterized the defense, defense phenotype of, of a couple different types of virulent uh, wheat plants and to a, a virulent or a couple different types of wheat lines to a virulent and virulent um, uh, lines of passion fly. And we found that there are indeed defense phenotypes that, that can confer resistance that are expressed in the whole plant. That's not the point of this. Okay? The point of this is that since we collected spectral data on the plants themselves, it was easy enough to calculate NDVI, right? But if NDVI is your measure of greenness, okay, you would expect something that's greener to be healthier. This isn't the case, right? That's four days. Whether you're an infested or a non infested plant, your NDVI number looks the same, right? At 12 days, you're still similar to the controls. Why is that? Hessian fly, like many insects, have unique properties where their genetics can interact with plant genetics to modify plant phenotypes in their favor. You can see an increase in nitrogen containing compounds. Nitrogen is a major player in protein. Proteins are a, a growth limiting um, reagent for insect growth and development. So insects are able to manipulate these. The point of this is, if you were to look at this and say, well, NDVI will tell me which one has, which one has Hessian fly on it, you would get the wrong answer, right? So you can trick a lot of these indices as well. Very useful, uh, a lot of applications, but they also uh, lack specificity and, and you definitely can manipulate or they can be manipulated to give you a different, uh, different answer. The second way where we spend most of our time is functional trait estimates. So if we think about, you know, what influenced the spectrum, we see, you know, we know green as chlorophylls do. Uh, we have the structure, palisite, parenchymas, mesophyll cells, cell walls, lignins, cellulose, all the structural components. They all influence the shape of this, this spectral profile. So the question is, the question is how do we, you know, 
how do, how do we exploit variation in that spectral profile to understand variation in chemistries, right? Or in structural components. And we know we can do that because there's been a number of published chemically important absorption features. This is an older figure, but it still does the same thing, where you can see that there are certain wavelengths or grouping of wavelengths uh, in many cases, especially when you get into specific types of secondary metabolites, uh, such as phenolics or terpenoids, that can be exploited to, to say this wavelength range is related with the concentration of the structure. And that's due to the fact that light interacts with the functional groups of these compounds or with the base structures themselves. So it's something we can exploit. And what you do, and this is from an older paper um, where I was interested in the induction of a specific secondary metabolite in response to insect feeding, uh, specifically with milkweed and monarch butterflies. And what we did is over a time course series, did both the chemistry to understand retinolides is a steroidal toxin that will stop ion transport. It's not good for your heart in too high of a dose. Uh, and we related that variation with variation in the spectral data. And then using statistical modeling, we're able to build a predictive model. In this particular example, we use what's called partial least squares regression. There's a number of other approaches. Partial least squares regression is not the only one. Uh, it's, it's probably one of the more, more commonly used ones, um, but there are other approaches. So once you combine the variation, what you can actually get is a model that you can estimate the chemical, physiological, structural composition, of vegetation using only the coefficients and applying them using only the spectral data themselves, right? So that's the benefit of this approach. Plus one spectral measurement can get you a whole bunch of measurements as I'll show you from uh, work that, that we've been doing. To date, we've published uh, models and studies showing variation in the number of compounds, primary, secondary metabolite structure, how all of these respond to stress, whether it's pest and pathogen pressure, whether it's abiotic stress, uh, nutrient stress, water stress, things like that. So really, I, I like to say that, you know, the ability to do this is limited only by your imagination of what you think you can model, right? And I'll show you some, some extremes that we're moving into uh, as we go forward. Spectral phenotyping. So we know that chemistry, genetics, drug chemistry, um, all of that influences the spectral profiles, but we can't measure all of that. We can't measure all of the genotypes that exist in the world for form, right? And we don't know all of the chemistries that we can measure either. We have two unknowns, right? So we can't, we can't measure those. But what we can do is use the variation if you believe that spectral data are sensitive to the chemistries, physiology, and all of the underpinning things that drive that. Um, in vegetation, then you can use variation leaf spectra as a surrogate for genetic variation, stress responses, responses to um, put them in a breeding application. So you can use this data as an indicator of plant stress um, or genetic variation, right? Just using the spectral data alone. So that's another uh, application. I like this particular example. And it's simply because uh, the goal, we were invited to do some work down in Central America. The goal was to measure responses of oak to different levels of water stress. The standard measures, photosynthesis, water relations, things like that, weren't really working. So we figured maybe uh, spectral data can, uh, can do something. And the idea was that, that the spectral profiles of these plants would separate out depending upon the provenance, where they came. What we found, and this is kind of a cherry pick example, is that the area that had mild and high rainfall, so relatively um, less severe uh, drought conditions, had greater responses to each of these four had a different watering condition. Okay, so spectrally, they were more sensitive to different water conditions than the population that came from Puerto Rico, which has more severe drought conditions. Right, so if we go back to this concept of optical types, we can start to think that hmm, maybe we can use this to understand evolutionary processes, local adaptation, things like that. 
Lastly, we kind of we use them for maps and scaling up. So if you have this coordinated collection of spectral data, you can start to build these um, using airborne and satellite imagery. And really quickly, here's an example that I did when I was at Wisconsin, where we took uh, Aspen stands and we ended up building models to predict secondary metabolites that are known to influence insect-mediated ecosystem processes. We then applied those and, and we related it to, to other things. But these are the kind of maps that you can you can generate, and then you can relate them to other forms of data. So I'm going to switch after I get done with this slide really quickly, and then talk about my group. But in row crop egg. Since I've been here, we've done work in uh, wheat with uh, pest resistance, nutrient use, uh, nutrient use efficiency, potato disease identification. We work in cannabis uh, with functional trait variation, using spectral data to quantify changes in THC and CBD implants. Uh, disease detection. In a maze, we've, we've used it to look at low ground pest detection, and we've started to move into a breeding context where if we believe we can use all of these data to get all of this functional information, if that's at all related to any type of genetic gains, then possibly we can use that information to improve breeding practices. Okay. So I'm gonna move to digital forestry. There's been a huge shift in the college, so I'm gonna focus. I have a number of people working on digital forestry. Um, so forests contain an additional barrier. They're really tall. I'm not saying corn isn't tall, but Trees are really tall. Um, so you have this kind of vertical issue that you deal with as well. Remote sensing has approaches that you can use to kind of get at these um, understanding uh, forest health systems, but there's a lot of questions that still remain um, about how do we integrate remote sensing into the forest map. I'm gonna quickly go through a few objectives. Uh, can we use spectral data to understand tree status in response to stress? Um, and can we use that to scale up, right? Can we do this at larger spatial scale? Somewhat separate projects driven by different people, um, but they do come together. Um, this figure is an interesting one. Um, about five or six, seven years ago, the idea of spectronomics, you can put an omic, like you put the suffix omic on any, it's, it's not important. Um, but the idea is that the take home from this is that the concept of spectronomics can be a bridge to encapsulate genomics, transcriptomics, proteomics, all of the other omic disciplines combined, potentially. Do I think it works perfectly? Absolutely not, and I can guarantee it does, right? But that doesn't mean that, that there aren't possibilities. And for the rest of the talk, this is all work. When I say we, it's really my students, postdocs, and everybody else that's working. Uh, there's a few people here. I'll highlight some of um, Sylvia's work um, and Ellie's work as well. So keep in mind that like, this is all, at least you get the kudos for this, not, not me. All I'm doing is standing up here trying to interpret what they told me. So the first part, um, this first part, can we get at kind of leaf level understanding of stress? So this is uh, Sylvia's over here. She's a PhD student, mine in the Jacobs lab. A uh, former postdoc of mine, Lorenzo Petrozzi. Why do we work at the leaf level? Because it's exceptionally controlled. We figure if it's going to work there, it's going to, you know, it's got. If it doesn't work there, it's not going to work if you stand 20 feet away from it and try and capture it. So Sylvia did. Sylvia and Lorenzo did a number of experiments where we exposed a number of different trees, focusing on high value hardwoods uh, to a number of different stressors. Say. What can we learn about stress in these uh, from these measurements about these trees in these different environments? We kind of use standard approaches, um, collective tissue chemical analysis, so the physiological measurements uh, that we did to combine them with uh, spectrometer data. And then I'll kind of go in what we had. So we had disease detection, we had nutrient deficiency, we had water stress, um, salt, which is a fairly common. Uh, stress, whether you're in containers, um, especially in container or kind of nursery type settings. Uh, and we were interested, what kind of, what can we model from these stressors, right? How accurate can a lot of these physiological and chemical measurements that we make, how accurate are they going to be? And can we separate out these stressors based on their spectral data by themselves? The next series of slides all look like this, and I don't want you to read them. 
Okay, what I want you to do is look at the way the line goes from the bottom left to the top right. Okay, that's all you really need to focus on. There's a whole bunch of stuff in here related to, to gas exchange, photosynthetic efficiency, right? The point of it is most of the functional traits that we measured were predicted uh, well by the spectral data. We were able to get externally validated data that's, that, that suggests that we can recreate a number of things. Okay, so photosynthetic properties. Gas exchange, chlorophyll fluorescence. Water status. Again, most of these functional traits predicted very well. Just look at the lines. That's all you got to look at. Don't try and read what it is. You want to know what all of these sweep of how many? So we have 25. However many traits she's been working on. Um, just, just we can, you can take a look later. I'm happy to talk through these with you. And then we moved into, she's been really pushing hard on the chemistry, so primary and secondary metabolites, uh, pigments, we have things like sugars, gold sugars, um, starches, carbohydrates, phenolic compounds, uh, gallic acid is in there, common response to a number of different stressors. Um, again, most of these were predicted well by function, by, by spectral data, meaning that we should be able to then go into trees of comparable size, age. A lot of this was done in the greenhouse. Um, and use these models to say, you know what, we're, we're going to estimate a lot of these traits in response to this. And the neat thing about this, this is kind of a, um, it's a, it's a busy slide, but you can take mm. these predictions and put them into standard um, statistical analyses, right? Meaning you don't have, who here has measured BC max? I can tell you from, it sucks. It's, it's 25 to 30 minutes. And then you're at the, like, the mercy of how your plant is feeling at three in the afternoon, knowing that it took a nap and how it's doing. So if you can get an idea of how an estimate of that parameter without actually having to do that measurement, I mean, we can make hundreds of spectral measurements in an hour versus two or three BC max measurements. So you can import these into um, um, standard kind of statistical approaches. Um, we do see relationships between these things. So it's a way to get at what are the functional responses to different environments. We can start to see separation based on the spectral profile of the bone. Uh, this was specifically black walnut with um, a fungal pathogen, Geosmithia morbida, which causes staining. Black walnut is probably the most valuable hardwood in this area. Anytime you start to stain the interior of it, you're going you're gonna to lose money on veneer, right? So you're, you're degrading your product. And there's a lot of spread in these data, and we're still working on exactly what they mean. But on the bottom left, you can see that there is statistically significant separation between the two based on just the geosynthia versus the control. We repeated this experiment seeing, well, we change the environment, does it work? And it turns out that it does, because if you add drought, your spectral profile starts to compress. You don't see as much response to geosynthia, it becomes masked by uh, the presence of drought, right? This is an important take home point because spectroscopy, remote sensing, none of these are silver bullets that can answer all questions, right? So we need, my group does quite a bit of work to try and understand what are the caveats as we, you know, as we move forward with this. What can it do? What can't it do? Again, droughts separate out a lot of spread still, a lot of spread. Trees are notoriously hard for drought because they're happy and then they're dead. So, you know, it's not like you're looking at a herbaceous plant that <clears> kind of goes wilty, you know, a couple of days without water and continues on just like this nice linear trajectory. Trees kind of, you can't tell, you can't tell, and then all the leaves fall off. So they tend to have different strategies, um, evolutionary strategies, than, than a lot of other things. Nutrients, uh, all of these, you can, you can start to get ideas how we can incorporate these into different management techniques. If you know you need to fertilize a tree and you're in a nursery, this can tell you that you need to fertilize a tree. So we're going to shift to a different type of application. Um, 
And we're going to start to look at how can we look at disease in kind of larger spatial scale settings and plantation settings, right? Uh, what we're going to focus on, this is really driven by two of my postdocs, um, Ali Masjedi, who's now at Bayer, and uh, Baroque Naziri, who's now with NASA. Um, chestnut was the dominant tree in the northeastern U.S. Uh, chestnut blight wiped it out. It still exists on the landscape. There's a whole bunch of work to try and develop resistant mines to reintroduce chestnut on the landscape. There's genetic resistance, um, genetic modification that can confer resistance, but there's this, you know, how do you contain it, how does it spread, um, all of those things. And um, you see this initial canker occurring on the bowl, and then you start to see crown dieback. So it's nothing that until later stages when you start to see crown dieback, actually see canopy-like symptoms, right? You would have a full canopy green again, right? The question is, can we actually detect sick from non-sick plants when you can't see that they're actually sick? If you can see they're sick, you really don't need any $100,000 set of equipment to say that plant looks for So, this took place, there's a common, uh, common garden, kind of a competition garden that was planted um, a while back in Martell Forest, just off campus. Chestnut was one of the trees planted. Um, we started to notice blight come in. What are we in 2022? So about four-ish years ago, we started scoring for blight in 2018. And from 18 to 19, we actually got a pretty nice distribution. If you can see from not a whole lot of plants, uh, in the zero class, which is um, no blight, all the way up to 2020, we got uh, a number of the plants had blight, okay, and, and pretty severe. So there's this nice distribution that we captured over this time frame. And really the goal, the goal was to see, can we track from an epidemiology standpoint, this spread? Can we track it through time? Even though it's a controlled, you know, setup, we know where everything is. The proof of concept is we can do this over multiple times. We can track the spread, which allows us to say, well, this pocket looks really bad in a management setting. Maybe we can go in and clean this up somehow, you know, to prevent further spread. So that was the goal. Um, this was all done in collaboration with some folks from engineering, um, Doug Dick, Doug Crawford, uh, Matt Kinzel, um, and it was all UAV based. We also have aircraft imagery that we're working on. Um, I'll talk about that in one second. Uh, but we flew LIDAR, full range hyperspectral RGB. From the LIDAR, we were able to kind of get a digital surface map, and then we could start to extract individual points. All the colored dots are the trees we use in this particular uh, plantation. You can see the cars in there to get you know, an idea of the scale. These trees were planted at different uh, densities. Some were planted at one meter spacing, some were planted at three meter spacing, right? Um, so there's a lot going on in this. So we identified a number of chestnut trees in this, this figure that we were going to census repeatedly. We were able to pull out the spectral data. We, we flew the UAV, and when I say we, I mean the engineers flew the UAV. Um, three time points, June, August, and September, with the idea being, do you need just one flight? Or can you just do a mid-season flight? Or what's the best timing for flight to get the most information out of it? To compare them across years, we normalize the data. Um, so this is just kind of the raw spectral features that were extracted uh, across the different uh, severity indices. We then imported those data into classification models uh, this particular is just support vector machine uh, classification, and we did it at multiple different combinations of uh, severity, disease severity or pressure, disease pressure, right? So if we had 0, 1, 2, and 3, 3 being really severe, 0 being clean, we started to bend them in different ways to see how sensitive those data would be to the, to the presence of disease. And what we get is fairly decent, in my opinion, um, accuracy. We also started to reduce band subsets to see how much information is too much information. You know, do you need all of those bands or can we just condense it to a handful of bands? We're going through to select which bands were the most influential right now. Um, but you see across the board, and for the most part across bands, uh, we're at about 
75-ish, 73-ish percent accuracy. 50% of the data were held out, 50%. Um, the model was built on 50% of uh, external validation. Confusion matrix in the upper right shows that you're running at about a 60% um, um, classification of control and about 85% classification of whether you have or do not have. This is binomial uh, blight, okay? And it, it roughly stays the same if you use 69 bands versus 261 bands. So we're still playing around with the optimal number. If we go to three classes, we see it drops. Remember, the other one was at about 75. Right now, we're at about 63-ish, somewhere in the mid-60s, right? And if you look at the confusion matrix, you see that those start to drop as well. So if you look at your bottom right, your classification of blight, uh, when you have severe blight drops, your classification of blight, when you have mild blight, um, really, we're starting to get to a coin toss in this case, right? And if you start to include all four classes, it really kind of drops out to where we're approaching the 50% mark. Um, and it really doesn't matter. Again, band selection doesn't seem to influence this. Time of year doesn't seem to influence this. Although bands, the importance of specific bands do vary across the time of year. Um, why does this happen? I always like to think of this as the spork effect. Everybody knows what a fork is. Everybody knows what a spoon is, right? You put, a, put them together, you get a spork. And for as computationally powerful as computers are, they're still program driven. And sometimes they have difficulty separating things out if they don't separate out well, right? And the more we ask some of these programs to separate out, the less well they do that. And it really gets at what is the level of information important that everybody needs to, to oh, what I do. There's a side button. There. Um, what's the level of information that a manager, right, is going to require? What type of flight? When is the flight? Um, what type of camera? I mean, for a lot of these. We then wanted to see the spread. So these are the predicted scores and I'll tick through these quickly and then we'll, we'll um, move on. We're just about to wrap up. But if we track, just look at the color change, right? That's all you need to know. So we built the model, applied it back to the spectra. I know it's a little double dipping, but we really don't have a whole lot of options. This is purely intended to create a visual to show that, that the model can actually track the progression of disease through time. So if you look at the number of red, dark red, uh, in this particular case, on the bottom right, you see most of it, you can start to see that shift through time. This matches up with the scores that we would take. And in 2020, you can see um, the progression of the disease continuing on. The agreement between what we scored and what the predictions were were very high. I can't remember what it is off the top of my head. We're still kind of putting some of that together. But the model works. And you can use it to track disease through time. That's the big take home message. Lastly, I'd like to introduce a newly funded project that we're working on, working with uh, Matt Ginzel. Um, we're working with a group from Penn State and Temple. Um, and this is Can We Use Remote Sensing Approaches to Detect Spotted Lanternfly Movement? Okay. Uh, spotted Lanternfly is right. Right there, and that's L, the one of them. Um, so it was introduced you know, in Pennsylvania. It's been spreading west. You can see um, the, the potential distribution based on climate-driven models, just temperature-driven models, of how well this test will move west. It covers Indiana very well. And while its natural host is Tree of Heaven, The central close to tree heaven, it will also, uh, younger instars will feed on things like black walnut and other more economically important non invasive trees, right? There's a good bet if you have a lantis in your backyard that eventually lantern fly will find you. Um, but that doesn't mean it's the only thing, and we're uncertain of the economic impact in this area that lantern fly will have. So, what Ellie did. 
first steps we were interested can if we make spectral measurements on the trees that have different levels of lantern fly do they separate out right so ellie went out to pennsylvania so we went and a couple other people i couldn't find that picture but um made measurements on these different you can see there's a control zero to 100 different densities of lantern fly and you can start to see a progression away from the control of the spectral data, right? So this is a preliminary figure. Um, there is statistically significant separation uh, between uh, some of these points. It's driven by the, the highest density of lanternfly. Uh, but really what this suggests is that we can use spectral data to start to separate out control versus medium densities versus higher densities of lanternfly. The future work that we're, we're starting this summer is to really try and use um, specifically small satellite data to um, model um, historical lantern fly movement, but also predict lantern fly movement in novel habitats based on post quality, right? So a very crude index of post quality combined with other landscape metrics that we can get from different satellite data, combine all those together and then project that over the expected range based on temperature with the ultimate goal of building a website that has a risk map assessment that's available to a man. Okay. You can go in, click, and say, this is also with Elizabeth Barnes, our exotic insect educator in entomology. Um, so uh, she's doing a lot of the outreach and a lot of working to kind of how do we how do we communicate this information to the public. All right. So in wrapping up. Spectral data has a number of different uses, right? Biology, chemi chemistry, physiology, all sorts of things. We can link all that back to genetics, breeding. Um, one of the things, you can greatly increase the volume of data you collect. Like I was saying, it's better, I prefer to do spectral measurements or make spectral measurements. You make 100 of them or 200 of them than to make three BC max measurements on a plant. Um, even if it's a little off, compared to your BC max measurement, which I can guarantee you if you were to try to replicate that would never happen. Um, you can start to understand how these data can be incorporated into different ecosystems. Uh, you can map these traits um, and you can link them to other information, right? Breeding is a very uh, a, a very green area. A lot, not a lot of people using these data in, in breeding. So there's a, there's a pretty wide open field. And with that, uh, I'd like to thank Collaborators here and at other places, uh, my lab, um, Ellie's work over there was featured today. Sylvia's work uh, was featured today as well. Uh, I'd like to thank funding, um, NSF CAS uh, um, provides some funding. Uh, the Digital Forestry Initiative has provided some funding. I would really like to thank the HDIRC, uh, the Hardwood Tree Improvement and Regeneration Center. For funding both of these projects before, um, at, at, you know, three, four years ago, um, and, and other funding sources that we've been able to kind of uh, keep this moving longer. With that, I'd be happy to take any questions. Oh, way, I'm just going to make sure. Yeah. Questions here in the room? Can I comment on potential influence on the plant on of the plant microbiome on spectral things? Limiting That's a good question. I, I would argue when you say plant microbiome, it, it, I think it depends. Right, on what the physiological chemical response of the plant is. If, if the influence of the microbiome is strong enough to elicit us that is sufficient to detect using, then yes, I think um, you would be able. And I hope I answered your question. I have one. Yep. 
uh, on those scatter plots that you showed where you said you looked at the shape of the line. Do you have a, a dream of, in order to tighten that, you would use some other measurement other than spectros spectroscopy? I suppose it would depend on what you're measuring, but is there some other magic bullet that could work with spectroscopy to improve some of these measures? And maybe it wouldn't work in all instances, but what are what are the good complements to spectroscopy? Yeah, that's that's a great question. Um, and I think it would depend on thinking from a plant biologist's perspective. I think it would depend on environmental variation. Right? So if you can include those factors into your measurements, then there's a good chance, depending upon what you're measuring, um, there's a good chance that that would help improve the um, model. Yeah. Yeah. It was multiple genotypes. Yeah. Um, actually, this was bedrock walnut, right, Sylvia? And a different species. So this was walnut and oak, okay. um, but not genotype specific. Other stuff we've done in maize has shown that they do, in some cases, translate across genotypes. Environments is, is another question altogether. So um, one of the reasons we do the work in the greenhouse is because we can manipulate the environment. If we try and do drought studies out at Acre, it'll never happen with corn yeah. because it'll rain. Um, and, and so being able to control um, the measurements I had a postdoc who did a paper on maize in a very similar vein with different physiological measurements. Um, we also included field-based measurements as well. We found that it actually improved the models when we started to bring field data in. So I, I have no doubt that increasing genetic variability, your measurements from genetic variability and environmental variability will help. A, a lot of these, I think, individuals assume that once you have a model, it's static which isn't the case. Anytime you include new variation in, right, you may need to account for that variation in your models, right? It, it's a bit frustrating when I tell people that, but that's a lot of people, that's why they like indices, because you can just calculate that across the board and you're not sensitive to all the fine scale spectral features that you need to extract to understand the more fine scale physiological and chemical responses. That's a very good point. And thank you for reminding me because actually looking for an individual, if anyone's interested, to do some kind of uh, transfer learning uh, with the group I collaborate with out at um, Uber and Engineering, Dr. Crawford. Um, we're, we're actively searching for individuals who are interested in taking measurements from leaves to canopies, <clears throat> to landscapes, to see if we can use this information to train this information and have it like have the arrow go both ways. So, yes. You had a, did you have a second point to that? I think I had one. Well, nitrogen always seems to work. What's that? One, one trait is the nitrogen. I'm sorry, I didn't. So which one can I mean, someone go with the trait? Which one can be explained? Oh, can't. Yeah. Well, you know, when, v, when, when VC Max was predicted well, I looked at the person who was really focusing on it, and I stared at uh, Sean, and I said, how the hell does this work? You know, I mean, VC Max is a theoretical, VC Max is a theoretical point on a curve, right? It's not an actual measurement. You're getting it by, by 
integrating a number of measurements over a time series. But it works. Um, and there's groups that have run with it. Out of Illinois, they're doing a ton of breeding for photosynthetic improvement in, in maize and sorghum using a lot of these approaches. So that one works. Why water potential works? We, we have a paragraph on why we think it works when we publish it, but in all fairness, like a lot of these physiological processes are complex. Um, complexes of multiple different things that come together, right? To, to cause water potential to change. So exactly what is driving those? I know some work has been done to show that, that you know, protein concentration and nitrogen concentration is strongly related to VC max. And there's a couple of other things that are related to those photosynthetic parameters. Um, but really when we get to the physiology, that's where it kind of starts to, I gotta think a lot more than just this functional group absorption makes sense. There's one question uh, online. Um, I'll answer the second one first. Uh, I don't know. Um, again, in many cases, we tend to work at highly controlled uh, levels to begin with. Again, if we control the environment and it, it works, we say, okay, let's introduce environmental variation, see if it doesn't. Right? I was surprised how well the UAV classification works. Um, so I don't have an answer for what's an ideal, and I don't think there is one. I, I, I prefer to keep it that it's really going to depend on what you know the researcher or um, you know the land manager is interested in, like what what best fits someone else's need, right? I mean, if we make models and we say like what's a good model? Right, there used to be this thing called RPG that didn't make any sense. Um, but, you know, is explaining 60% of the variation good with the RMSC of, you know, let's say it's 10% of your prediction? Is that good enough? You know, or, or does it have to be 90% and an RMSC, you know, that's oh two 2% error, right? That, that's not a question that I can, I can answer. That's, that's the end user question like that's they have to ask themselves so the models are simply that models that you can apply um i do like to use targets i think that helps um quite a bit i prefer i don't do a lot of radiator transfer modeling in fact i don't do any um, so a lot is not a lot is an exaggeration um and whether one is better again I, you know a lot of people believe in radiative trench modeling, um, empirical methods, statistical methods, I, I, that's just kind of what I have kind of developed. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. Can you find questions here? Can I have a question? Okay. Yep. Yes. Um, sorry, I didn't hear clear about um, the person just about asking the genetic variation. Do you mean spectral imaging data can capture genetic variation? Yeah. Okay. And having genetic variation in the model um, could, um, could make the model better? Yeah, it could. It could, but then you're still stuck with a finite level of genotype that you can you can use. So if you're characterizing some kind of genetic space and you say these 100 genotypes are what we're using, I'm sure that would improve the model. And um, understanding, and it really gets into how multivariate can you generate these parts or whatever your platform is to develop these models. Um, how multivariate can you, can you make it? Um, 
genetics would help. And there's a number of papers that show that including variation among genetics of your response is important, including the genetic. I haven't thought about actually the genetic. And are we talking about A, C's, C's, and G's, or are we talking about some kind of dissimilarity matrix from genetic information? Um, C, protein production. A lot of, there's a lot of different ways to go with this. So yeah, I think it would definitely help. Um, I don't think we, we haven't done any of that as literally as I think the question was. Okay, thank you. Well, thanks to all attending online and in person. Uh, thanks, John, for launching the Spring Series. Wonderfully, I learned a lot. Uh, greatly appreciate it. Yeah, thank My you pleasure. all. Have a great day.